and welcome to another edition of DT Live. Hope everyone is having a and good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on time zones. For those of you in the YouTube chat, let me know about my audio. Can you hear me? Give me a yay or a nay on the audio levels. Got my cup of coffee, uh, classified legendary in the chat. Do I do little or loads of sugar? No, I do no sugar in any of my drinks. So zero sugar, coffee, tea, water. You know, that's typically my drinks. Occasionally I'll drink a Diet Coke if I you know, feel like doing a soda. Uh, might do, you know, three or four of them in a week. <laughs> But, you know, typically, you know, a couple cups of co black coffee every day, some unsweet tea if I want a cold drink, or just plain water, drink a lot of water. And I started doing that, you know, like 25 years ago. When I was in college, I, when I was uh, getting my master's degree, uh, I moved from Louisiana to Athens, Ohio, because I was getting a master's degree at Ohio University in Athens. And I got there, and I had student loans. You know, I was going to be a graduate assistant, so everything was going to be paid for. But for whatever reason, my financial situation, it, it, the money wasn't ready for me as soon as I got there. I enrolled very late. The, the graduate assistantship I was offered was offered to me like a week before classes started that year. Like, you know, one of the professors called me and said, hey, we've got this position. You know, I got your name from another university that you applied at that you didn't go to. Hey, you want to come here? And I went there, you know, very quickly. When I got there, I had no money. So I had to, you know, budget a lot of things. One of the things that was out of the budget was uh, sugary sodas like Cokes. And I, I, couldn't go without coffee. You know, I bought coffee, but I didn't buy sugar. So for like, you know, six weeks or so, I was very financially strapped and I just drank a lot of black coffee. And, you know, once the money did come in, you know, as far as my student loans and everything, I just never went back to putting sugar in my coffee again. So, and it's probably for the best because, you know, sugar, especially sugar in drinks, it's just empty calories. I mean, why are you taking in calories when you're just wanting to quench a thirst, right? So it's basically when you put sugar in something, it's basically like you're drinking a meal. And there's no reason to do that if you're going to eat later anyway. It's one of the things, you know, when, you know, if you're trying to get in shape, if you're overweight and trying to lose weight, well, one of the easiest ways to quickly shed a few pounds, if you're one of those people that you take in a lot of sugar with drinks, just cut out all that. And, and it's quite easy to do. You get used to it really quickly. Just a few days of just drinking black coffee, unsweet tea, water, you know, and that's it. Right. Maybe a diet soda, you know, zero calorie soda. But cut out all the sugary drinks, cut out um, things like milk. You know, milk's pretty fattening, right? It's got a lot, a lot of calories in milk. Cut out fruit juices because all that's sugar. I mean, it's natural sugars, but it's still sugar, a lot of calories in that stuff. Yeah, Bob says he went to Splenda over 20 years ago. Yeah. Replace sugar with honey. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. I do occasionally put a little cream in my coffee if I feel like, you know, I want to spice things up a little bit. Yeah, today's stream is going to be me running through a installation of DTOS on Manjaro and see if it actually works. Because here in the last, I would say, four or five days, I've tried to fix DTOS, the uh, Arch Linux post-installation script. Because I know it's been broken. It's been broken for a while, and I haven't really worked on it probably in about six or seven months. It's been a long time since I worked on it because it's just a lot of work, and I didn't feel like it. I was really wondering, do, do I even want to continue this thing? And I was like, yeah, I do, but if I'm going to fix this, I want to streamline it a little bit. I want to make it not as much work on my part. So... I spent several hours over the last four or five days, you know, each, you know, a few hours each day working on this thing, uh, rebuilding some packages for the DTOS repo, uh, removing a lot of packages from the DTOS repo, and uh, really changing some software that gets installed. Uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit, but there's some things that were causing me some issues that, you know what, if it's going to be a headache, if it's going to cause me any kind of more work than what I want, you know, just get rid of it. So 
<laughs> so I stripped out some things from the script. Added some other stuff, though. Yeah, DTOS should go full-on Gen 2. Yeah, but testing that would be a real pain if I have to compile Gen 2 every time I want to test DTOS. Yeah, so no, not going to happen. We're not doing source-based distributions. Yeah, just because of your Arch ISO vid, I was able to start making my own distros. So thanks, yeah. yeah. And, you know, that's another thing. You know, I was making uh, DTOS available as an ISO as well, and I haven't released an ISO in about four months or so. And I may not do any more ISOs, or I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking about it, but what I don't want to do is I don't want to do the Calamaris installer on an ISO anymore because that's just a headache. You know, because with our Arch-based distribution, you need to put out an ISO at least every month or so. You know, maybe two months, you know, but you really can't go that much longer. And then always having to rebuild Calamaris because uh, it's constantly being updated. And then, you know, if things change, you know, fix the changes. You know, you've got to put in, you know, probably a couple of hours you know, of work just on maintaining Calamaris every month. Right. Uh and Smart Nema says, try Crystal's Jade and Jade GUI. I actually was thinking about that. Because at least that installer was built for Arch Linux. Like, it should not have the headaches that Calamaris has. Because Calamaris is really meant as a uh, distro agnostic installer. Which, it's, it's almost impossible to make a distro agnostic installer that actually works and is easy to use. And isn't uh, just a real pain in the tuchus, right? <laughs> Because every distribution is so different. A Debian-based distribution is quite a bit different than an Arch-based distribution. And then things like Gentoo, of course, quite a bit different than both of those. And then if you get into really weird stuff like Nix or Geeks, you know, things that don't even store files in the normal file hierarchy that most Linux distributions store things, you know, it's just... You know, if you're going to do a distribution, and here's the thing I've learned playing around with this stuff the last few years if you're going to do a distribution if you want to maintain a distribution and do it right make sure your installer you probably should write it yourself or at the very least take somebody else's installer that was designed for the distribution that you're actually building your distribution on so use an installer that was actually built specifically for arch linux so not the calamaris installer right but yeah the uh, Crystal's Jade installer might be the way I end up going if I do an ISO in the future. Uh, again, I'm not sure I want to do that. Or I may just do like an Arch ISO and just use the uh, Arch install script. You know, the, uh, the command line Arch install script that's quite easy to use these days and somehow try to, you know, attach DTOS to the Arch install script. That might be a way to go too. Because do I really need a, a live environment, like a GUI environment for people to boot into and use an installer? The Arch install, uh, the command line Arch install is so dang easy to go through, you know. But I don't know. I don't know how much of a headache that would be either. So, yeah, could you make a video about GNU Stow? Maybe at some point, but the GNU Stow is meant for managing your dot .files, and I already manage my dot .files, uh, with a git bear repo that, and I, it's been working for me for years. So I don't want to, I don't want to mess up what I've already got working. But I mean, I could play around, I could create like test repos or something and do, do something with GNU still on camera at some point. So today what I want to do is I want to work on the DTOS post installation script. So DTOS originally, you know, people were asking me to create my own Linux distribution. They've been asking that for years. You know, ever, ever since day one of starting the channel, people wanted, hey, why don't you create your own distribution? I'm sure you could do it. Why don't you create your own distribution? I've told people thousands and thousands of times I don't want to maintain a Linux distribution because it's a lot of work. It's not hard. Anybody can do this. I mean, I've done plenty of videos showing you how to do all the things to build a distribution, whether it maintain your own Arch repositories, building Arch package packages. Uh, I've showed you how to use the Arch ISO. I've showed you how to s play with settings in Calamar. Like everything about a distribution, I've showed you guys on camera so you guys can do it, right? I didn't do this because I wanted to do it, right? So, 
because I, again, it's not it's not like it's hard. It's not like it's difficult to do any of this stuff. It's just really, really time consuming. Maintaining packages is time consuming. These packages are always going to break. You're going to have to go fix package builds. You know, rebuild things in your repo. You know, that's just that's the nature of it. It's not hard. It's just time consuming. So I really resisted this for like the first two or three years of the channel. Didn't want to do a distribution. Then finally, I created a DTOS, the Arch Linux post installation script, which let's see if I go to my GitLab. My GitLab, by the way, is gitlab.com slash DWT1 and view all repositories because I've got a lot of them and actually go to groups. And one of the groups is DTOS and under DTOS, the group. Click on DTOS again, and this is the post installation script, and it's an org document, so it's commented, but you can see all the code blocks here, and you know, all this does is, basically it adds the DTOS core repository to your pacman.conf, and then it installs all the packages from the DTOS core repo uh, that I've specified in a package list file. And that kind of works you know, and I actually like that process. I think that's a smart way of creating distributions instead of doing uh, uh, installer like Calamari's or even having an ISO where people have to install a brand new distribution. You know, just let them install whatever arch based distribution they have and then, you know, just add the DTOS core repository or your repository if you create something like this and, you, and basically it should just be a matter of adding a repository to your pacman.conf and there you have DTOS or you guys OS or whatever Bob's OS uh, and I thought that was a good way a smart way to do this I think more people should do this but the problem with doing a Arch Linux script a post installation script on Arch Linux and Arch based distributions is every Arch based distribution is kind of different they all do different things, and because of that, the script would have certain errors in certain Arch-based distributions. So that created a headache. And But for a couple of years, that's the way I went. I did the post-installation script. And then later, I was like, you know what? I've changed my mind. But there's too many headaches with this because so many different Arch-based distributions are so different. The post-installation script is... is causing me more work than I want. So you know what, I'll create an ISO. So I created an ISO and all of those problems went away as far as, you know, people trying to install DTOS on Vanilla Arch or Arco or Manjaro or Endeavor or Garuda or Artix, you know, now they can't do that, right? I just, they get an ISO, right? So that solved all those problems. So the problem is creating the ISO creates its own world of problems, right? So now I just traded this one big basket of problems for another big basket of problems. It's still a lot of work. It's just different work. And I was like, uh, I don't like this either. So I, you know, did the ISO, released a couple of ISOs for a couple of months. And then I was like, you know what? I think the post installation script was the right way to go. So you know what? I, I don't know if I'm going to do an ISO going forward, although I might. Oh, I'm not totally ruling it out, but for right now, I'm just going to focus on the post-installation script. If I do an ISO going forward, though, I don't want to do Calamars. So that is where I'm at with the ISO. Go back to the chat before I get into the virtual machine, because here in a minute I'm going to launch a virtual machine. I've already downloaded Manjaro KDE. I've installed it and cloned it a couple of times in case I need multiple VMs of Manjaro. And the reason I'm going to test this on Manjaro... Uh, it's because Manjaro deviates from Arch the most. So if I'm going to run into an error that I might have to fix, you know, let's test it out in Manjaro first. Because Vanilla Arch, I, I'm quite certain, it, it should always work in Vanilla Arch. I, I want to test this thing in some of the Arch-based distributions. Yeah, Zero Linux, that's why I made one just for Vanilla Arch, yeah? Uh, you think it may be possible if you can make a video describing the commands used in Arch compared to Debian? I have Arch built on my laptop as well, but not familiar with the terminal like Debian. Okay. Well, I, all the terminal commands are the same in every Linux distribution as far as all your 
Shell utilities, the GNU core utils, the Bash shell, it's all the same on every single Linux distribution. The only thing that's different is the package manager. Debian uses the apt package manager. Arch uses Pac-Man. Fedora uses DNF. OpenSUSE uses Zipper. Um, Gentoo uses Emerge. You know, there's different package manager commands that you enter in the terminal. That's it. Uh, other than that, but like, you know, all your shell commands like uh, CD and LS and, and cat and grip, sed, all head, all, all the GNU core utils, all the bash shell stuff, it's all the same. So really what you're asking is, can I discuss the apt package manager versus Pac-Man? I've done videos about both, I'm pretty sure. So check my past videos, probably you had to go years back, but I know I've covered the basics of Pac-Man on video before and the basics of the apt package manager. There's not much to it. I'm not sure if they really need a, another video or a dedicated video about it. Using your package manager is pretty straightforward. One thing you could do is just read the man page. If you have TLDR installed on your system, you could just TLDR it. So for example, for me, if, let me switch to a different workspace. I have T TLDR, which is too long, didn't read, right? This is basically a short man page. So if I do a TLDR on, I don't know, LS, it'll give me the 10 most common ways to use or aid, whatever it is, the most common ways to use LS. And it'll give me some examples. So instead of reading a lengthy man page, you know, TLDR, let's see if they have one for apt. There you go. Right. And I'm not even running Debian, but you know, <laughs> but it pulls this stuff down from the internet as far as this database of uh, TLDR pages. But there you go. sudo apt update to update the system, right? sudo apt upgrade to upgrade all the packages. Yeah. And I'm sure they probably have one for Pac Man if you want to, you know, quick look at the TLDR for Pac Man. Yeah, I don't like the branding of Endeavor, and I don't see what it offers that Arch doesn't. Well, what it offers that Arch doesn't is it offers you an ISO that you can download that comes with an installer. <laughs> that's, what, that's what Endeavor offers you. And for some people, that's what they want. Not everybody wants to install Arch the Arch way. And Endeavor's been doing that, you know, for for many, many, many years. Before it was even Endeavor, of course, before that it was uh, Antergos. Before it was Antergos, it was Synarch, because in the very first iteration of that distribution, it was uh, basically Arch with an easy installer and the Cinnamon desktop. It was Synarch, then it was Antergos, then it's now Endeavor. Let's see. Hey, DT, will you ever consider going live on Odyssey? Uh, maybe. I don't know. Uh, what was that honking? Yeah, if you hear weird noises here, there's a lot of people in the uh, office building today. And yeah, there's some strange stuff <laughs> happening in some of the other offices because I've heard some noises too. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that, man. You taught me more than my college professor has. LMAO. I don't know if that was to me, but if it was, appreciate that. Uh, arch install is too easy. I agree. I mean, why not just do the arch install script? All right, guys. So let's go ahead and run through a quick installation of DTOS in a virtual machine with Manjaro KDE because I don't want this stream to take all day. So let me launch vert manager here. Oh, if I can type vert manager right. And I've already cloned a couple of VMs of Manjaro KDE, and I've already updated them to make sure they are up to date. So let's start with this one. So this should just be an already installed Manjaro KDE, and I've already done a Pac-Man SYU. So from here, we should just be able to get clone the DQS uh, repo, get the installation script, and run it. Let's log into Plasma. All right, so first thing, obviously, we need is a terminal. 
and well, their terminal font in Manjaro by default is really small. I'm going to zoom way in just so everyone can see this. So the first thing we need to do is git clone the DTOS repo where the installation script lives. So uh, gitlab.com slash DTOS slash DTOS. Clone that repo and then CD into that repo by doing ls. You see this file here, it's got the bold font. That is Manjaro and the Z shell. I believe they're using ZSH by default. That's letting you know that's an executable file. Well, let's execute it and let's see how it goes. I'm just going to run through it first and see if it actually completes. And if it completes, we'll go back and I'll actually open up the script and uh, show you some of the code. But I'm just curious if this runs. I'm not certain that this will work. So right now, it edited our locales. It's adding the chaotic AUR, although there was a little font problem that I'll fix later. It is downloading some keys, probably the uh, keys for the chaotic AUR and the mirror list for the chaotic AUR, because I'm adding that to DTOS. It wasn't there before, but I've added that, and I'll explain why I did that after this quick little test run. Choose your window manager, choose at least one. The choices are Qtile, Awesome, BSPWM, DWM, and Xmonad. Now I have no idea if all these configs are up to date and working. I know Qtile is working, that's why I went ahead and said if unsure, Qtile is the recommended choice, or install them all and have five options and try out each of them. Now I'm going to install each of them because I want to make sure that all of them work. Well, I'm going to go ahead and install Qtile, let's install Awesome. Let's install BSPWM. Let's install DWM. DWM is the one that I have the least amount of faith that my configs still work with that. Because I haven't logged into DWM in a while. Not that my builds of DWM should ever change or things break, but I did have some things going on with DWM blocks uh, as far as, you know, with the panel. And to be honest, I, I wouldn't mind just removing DWM from this script. Because I don't think most people really need help with DWM. Like if you're somebody that likes suckless software, you've got your own builds of your stuff. Do you really need my builds? Wow, it's starting to rain really hard outside. So if you guys hear some thunder, it's storming today. Would you like to install Xmonad? So this is the fifth and last window manager. Let's install them all though. I'll log in to each of them just to see if they actually load. Uh, try installing Hyperland, not on DTOS. I don't want to, uh, I don't want people to use something that I can't test and I can't really test it because I have an NVIDIA card and uh, I'm not going to add anything that could be broken and then people will be wanting me to fix and I can't fix it. So I, I don't need that sort of headache in my life. Uh, so I'll, I'll add it once I can actually use it. Um, select one or more web browsers. So now we get to software selection where with the space bar, for example, I could install Brave, which I think Brave is one of the default programs that gets installed anyway, eventually. But, you know, I could tick it on here. Let's add, I don't know, GNU IceCat. Heck no. Let's add Cute Browser just to see you know, if it actually installs them. Looks like it was fine because it didn't complain. Uh, other internet programs, so like your email and chat programs. Um, I skip all this. I don't really need any of this for purposes of the VM. Uh, same thing with multimedia programs. We'll just skip all that. VLC gets installed, though. That's one of the default programs. Uh, your office stuff, definitely not. Would take up a lot of space in the VM. And the games are a little too big for me to, uh, especially things like... Uh, Zero AD is a very big game for, you know, it takes up too much space. So I'm not going to do any of the games. And I'm not certain that all those programs would install at some point. I need to create a really big VM and go and tick all of those programs on just to see if they install successfully. And the reason I'm not sure they all will install successfully is because some of them are AUR programs. And if they're AUR programs and they're not in the chaotic AUR, they will not install properly with DTOS as it's currently configured. And there's a reason for that. Is we'll get into that later, though. Yeah, it looks like, though, it installed 
all of the default programs in the DTOS package list. So, you know, all the standard stuff that shouldn't always get installed. Which if that's, that would be where the script fails on Manjaro is, you know, some of my packages conflict with Manjaro packages or dependency problems or whatever it happens to be. That's where the script would have failed if it was going to fail. Once we got past that point, I am at least 95% confident that the script will actually install correctly now. Let's see. Yeah, it's going to install Zathura, which is, of course, the PDF viewer. Uh, it's installing MPD. Why am I installing MPD by default? It must be a dependency for something. Because I don't think I install an MPD uh, audio player. All right, and the last thing is copying DTOS configuration files, and then it says uh, Polybar, Xmo bar. Yeah, it's a little confusing because I should space that out or ask the question before. I am not sure. But anyway, we're going to choose both Xmo bar and Polybar to this question. So some of the formatting is a little confusing, but it wasn't an error, at least. And then finally, choose your user's default shell. I'm going to choose the fish shell. DTOS has been installed. Do you want to reboot? Y for yes, or Y is already the default. I think I could just hit enter. Yep. That's going to reboot the VM. I don't know if it'll automatically detach the ISO or not, because I have used this VM at least once just to make sure that it launched. Yeah, I didn't see a grub. Did you guys see a grub menu? Oh, I guess it did. Because it gives us DTOS, right? Our uh, SDDM theme. Let's log in to Qtal. Now, Qtal, I'm quite certain, should just work. And it does. Get rid of the Manjaro Hello program. Let's do an xrander-s 1920 by 1080 to get a proper screen resolution. Let's redraw the wallpaper. So I'll do super PB and let's set a random wallpaper just to get a wallpaper that is uh, drawn. Oh, I didn't mean to keep changing wallpapers, but to get it to draw a new wallpaper at 1920 by 1080. Did Alacrity get installed? It did. Rofi obviously got installed. There's our run launcher. Switch from D menu to Rofi, and I'll explain why. You know, I've made some, some different choices now on some of the software. Um, again, because any software that caused me headaches in the previous version of the script, we just got rid of Emacs, Super EE, -E, and this is obviously just a plain vanilla Emacs, which I kind of expected Emacs not to quite work right. So let's try a slash user slash bin slash emacs dash dash daemon. Let's see what the error is. Unable to start the emacs. Oh, another instance of emacs is running. So let's kill all emacs and then up arrow and rerun the daemon. Warning due to a long standing bug, but it did start correctly but it is not using our config. Why is it not using our config? Let me zoom in here in Alacrity and let's cd into dot config slash emacs dot config slash emacs does not exist. Is there not a, well there's a dot config folder. Okay, so cd into dot config. Well it definitely copied all of our config files as I see, you know, our Rofi and Qtile config, you know, all that stuff is working. But I created a package specifically for my Emacs. And I don't think it got copied over. So let's cd into slash etsy slash dtos. So this folder here, slash etsy slash dtos, all the dtos config files get installed here. This is where they live on the system. So if I cd into slash etsy slash d t o s dot config slash emacs is it there now maybe i didn't install it sudo pacman dash capital s i believe i called the package dt max and installs just fine so now that's ls slash etsy slash 
uh, DTOS slash config Emacs. Yeah, now it's there. Okay. So DT Max, I guess I didn't install it. It's not part of the package list of programs. It needed it to be. So I need to fix that. So that's an error. So we'll fix that when I go take a look at the script. So now what I need to do is copy recursively slash Etsy, oh, slash Etsy, slash DTOS, slash dot config, slash Emacs over into the home directory dot config slash Emacs. Go back to the home directory. All right, now we've got to kill the previous running Emacs because it's using the vanilla config. We started the server, so we've got to kill that instance of Emacs first and then restart the daemon. And now let's see if it actually uses my config. It does not. I suspect the problem will be if I do a ls in my home directory. Did it create an emacs.d directory? Yes. Because it launched the vanilla version of Emacs first, it creates this uh, default.emacs.d config directory in your home config. But I'm using the .config slash emacs directory for my configs. So rm-rf.emacs.d. Also make sure there isn't just a .emacs file in this directory. There is not. So now kill all Emacs, restart the daemon. Hmm. Still is just using the vanilla config. Why is that? Make sure right, still the Emacs.d directory is there. Why did it not delete that? It deleted it now. Let's try it again. Okay, now it's working. Now it's pulling down all the uh, packages for my Emacs config. Now that is a problem that should be taken care of once I add the DT Max package to the package list and my config files get installed properly. But because they, I didn't have it installed properly, it installed vanilla Emacs first and it created that annoying uh, home directory dot Emacs dot D, which conflicts. You know, if that directory exists, Emacs will try to read that directory before it goes into the dot config slash Emacs directory. So that's a, a bug, but that's one that we can fix. And now this will be my version of Emacs. It's still got some packages to install. It's going to be installing for a couple of minutes. But I think that'll work. So let's quit out of uh, Qtel. So let's log out. And let's quickly see if everything else works. So I try to log into Awesome. I haven't logged into Awesome in a while, so I don't know if the DTOS Awesome configs still work with the latest versions of Awesome. It's taking a second to load. But it loads. Yep, everything works. Super EE -E launches Emacs, and that is my Emacs. Now it's finished installing all the packages, so that is DT Max. So now let me super shift Q. Now Awesome is using a D menu instead of Rofi. So just for consistency's sake, I should probably change all the configs to use the same run launcher by default. Although you can you can use whatever run launcher you want very easily. You can switch these things. Uh, the way I have it configured is you can just tack on a flag to certain commands in your window manager config files and it just changes everything over from dmenu to rofi or from rofi to dmenu so it's very easy to move one to the other um xmonad or this is bspwm yeah this is bspwm bspwm does look like it is working correctly yep so let's quit out of BSPWM. The one that I had the least amount of faith in that it would work is DWM. Just because I haven't really worked on any of my uh, suckless builds in years, practically. So DWM, I don't think it launched because DWM usually doesn't take 
that long to, to load. Like Awesome takes a couple of seconds because my Awesome config is very big, but DWM is a really small piece of software. Obviously DWM, I don't think it's working. So what I'm going to do is go back out to the virtual machine and to switch to a TTY, you can't just do a, like a control alt F3 like you could on your keyboard in a virtual machine because it's actually going to do that on the host machine. So I have to go through the menu here and switch to TTY3 in this case is what I'll switch to. And let's do a sudo uh, systemctl stop sddm to stop our display manager, which will kill the window manager that was running or trying to run. And then let's do a sudo systemctl start sdwm or sddm. And now I get back to the login manager. So DWM is broken. I'll probably just remove that from the config. Like I said, I'm not, I'm not too concerned about DWM. I don't think most people that use DWM are going to use my configs anyway. Well, like people maintain their own builds of things like a DWM and ST and things like that. So X Monad works, but it looks like there's a little problem with the config. I can't see what the error is. Let's do an X render 1920 by 1080 again. Let's redraw the wallpaper again just to get that. Uh, the conky is all weird too, so let's just kill the conky to get it out of the way. So it is complaining about PacMD, uh, complaining about the volume widget. And I'm assuming this is Polybar that's running, not XMOMAR. Uh, let's do an X prop. Let me click on the panel just to make sure there. Yeah, that's Polybar. So whatever I'm using, whatever command I'm using to get the volume in Polybar, that command does not exist, or that script does not exist. It's looking for why well, it is moving so fast it's hard to read, but it's looking for something in .config slash polybar slash script. So let's cd in .config slash oh, polybar slash scripts. Let's do an ls. It's looking for, for PA volume, pulse audio volume. Okay, that makes sense. That is, let's see what the problem is. I don't think I wrote this script. I think I found it online. Uh, command not found, packmd. What is packmd? What package is that in? Verify that that is, in fact, not here. I uh, wonder if I could just do a sudo pacman-s packmd. Nope. I could do a quick Google search though. Let's see, Pulse Audio. Uh, you guys are not going to be able to see this. Not me getting out of this. Well, I went to Pulse Audio examples in the Arch Wiki. AccuMD. You know what, did Pulse Audio even get installed? I didn't even think about that. I would think it did. Let me go back to the VM. We've got Etsy Pulse and User Include Pulse. Uh, start uh, installed pipe wire pulse are in conflict okay so I think I think what I need to do is just get rid of that volume script or use something different in polybar to get that information because probably don't want to remove pipe wire so so that's another bug that I need to fix so and that's only if you use polybar with uh, xmonad if you used xmobar uh, it uses a proper SysTray with a volume widget. So, uh, so that's just a polybar error. That polybar error probably, it probably exists in BSPWM now that I think about it. I can't remember if BSPWM was uh, wigging out a little bit. 
with its polybar because it uses polybar too. So, but anyway, overall, it actually worked a lot better. I mean, that's the first run of this version of DTOS that I just I finished like the final edits of that thing literally 30 minutes before starting today's stream. So uh, the fact that there's not that many errors kind of surprised me. And none of the errors are anything major. Like these are really easy things to fix. All right, let's go back to the comments. Let's read, I know I was away for a while during that installation process. But that's uh, that was the biggest thing I wanted to do. And here in a minute, we're actually going to go dive into the script itself. Look at some of the code. Because some of the errors, I know exactly how to fix them. So... Oh, let's see. Yeah, more let's talk about Arch install. Yeah, creating your own ISOs. Let's see, Victor says hi everyone. How you doing, Victor? More highs from Corgi and yeah, Bunny. It has 500 wallpapers. I don't know what has 500 wallpapers. DTOS only has a very slim 325 wallpapers. I think. Actually, let me get out of this because it's annoying watching that uh, polybar freak out. Let's get back into Qtile since it actually works. Not Qtile, Wayland, Qtile, Qtile. Qtile Wayland will not work. Not with my configs anyway. So if I open a terminal, let's do a ls of user share backgrounds, DTOS backgrounds. Uh, like a, oh, actually, I don't install all 325 wallpapers. I curated the list because it's such a big download because they're images uh, to like 30 images or so. so. This is all you get in the post installation script. Now on the ISO I created, uh, because you didn't have to download those, I could actually just add those to the ISO image. I did include all 325 wallpapers on the ISO. So yeah, DTOS-backgrounds on the ISOs. Crazy large, you know, you guys got a lot of wallpapers in that thing. Because wallpapers are the most important part to a distribution, let's be fair. Let's see, why not use Pipewire? I, I believe I'm installing Pipewire. Pipewire is the default uh, for Arch anyway, so uh, yeah, I'm not removing Pipewire. The problem is that that whatever widget uh, for Polybar I was using, I was using that before I was using Pipewire on Arch. You know, those Polybar configs are kind of old. And it was trying to do something that just doesn't work now with the way uh, Pipewire and Pulse are configured. I'll probably just delete that widget for now. Or just use a different command for the volume widget in Polybar. Or I may just get rid of some of the... Uh, any window manager that's causing me any major issues, I may just remove it from the installation script for now. They'll still be in the repo. You can still install them if you want to play with some of the broken configs. They'll still be in the repo. You can get them if you have the DTO, DTOS core repo added to your pacman.conf. But I may not want people to choose these things right now because they'll choose them in the installation and they're like, hey man your DWM didn't even load it's like uh yeah there is the repo for DTOS wallpapers there is on my GitLab I get back to the desktop so if you go to uh not the DTOS script but the DTOS group that's got all of this stuff you have DTOS-backgrounds. Now that is the curated list that gets installed. You know, that's the slim down list. But if you want the full list, go all the way back to gitlab.com slash DWT1. View all for the repos. And look for the repo of wallpapers. And this is just a massive list of wallpapers. Lots of wallpapers. Uh, and you guys, if I do super PB on my system and open SXIV, 
that's the 320 some odd wallpapers, you know, from that repo. And again, if I ever make a proper ISO, I'll actually include all the wallpapers. It doesn't make sense to do it as part of a post installation script because I would create a package that's got 325 very large images, right? And then people have to install that package. That package may take 10 minutes to install. Uh, so that would be something I, I would, would want to be part of a proper ISO rather than you know, as part of one big package. Yeah, Glitch, your DDoS script got me into Xmonad, led me to make my own config. Thanks, dude. I don't know if I would have if not for you. Yeah, appreciate that. Yeah, these things seem harder than they are. Like, Xmonad really intimidated a lot of people. Xmonad's been one of those window managers. It's been around forever. And people that are fans of it, you know, just love this window manager. But it was always super niche uh, because it... Haskell. Haskell scares people. The Haskell programming language, it has this reputation of being like one of the more difficult programming languages to learn and understand. And, you know, part of the problem is nobody ever really tried to teach people about Haskell or Xmonad, you know. They're just not, other than my videos on Xmonad on YouTube, you don't get a lot of Xmonad content, right? So I tried to change that a little bit. Even some of my just Haskell programming videos, because I've done five or six videos just about Haskell, not necessarily about Xmonad, but explaining the, the Haskell language, um, how to create GTK apps using Haskell and things like that. And, you know, it's, it's, not as, it's not as daunting a task, you know, using Haskell as what a lot of people make it out on the Internet. Don't believe all the memes. Have you tried out the DK window manager? It's pretty good. I don't know DK. I've never really heard of it. If it's a Wayland window manager, which might be why I haven't heard of it, uh, I can't use Wayland. So right now I'm not going to use Wayland on my home computer. I've got an NVIDIA card. So all these Wayland uh, window managers you guys ask about were probably a year or two away for me and a lot of other people. <laughs> it's not just me, right? Wayland's just not quite there for everybody for all equipment yet. Once it is, yeah, I'll be ready to take a look at all this and we'll go into it full steam ahead. But I, I can't do it if I can't actually run these things. I'm not going to take a look at a window manager I can't actually run on my home computer and live in. It just doesn't make sense to take a look at something if I can't live in it, as far as a window manager, right? Because that's typically the way I do these things. I live in them for a few weeks and configure them and... Have you heard of Madebox? Oh, of course. I've done several videos about Madebox. It's a Manjaro spin with open box on it. Yeah. Great distribution. All right, so let's get into the config. So we've run through the installation. You guys get to see the installation. Now let's actually take a look. Oh, let's toggle these links back on. All right, so this org document looks good. Let me zoom way in here. So this is the DTOS script. Now this is the readme.org, but the readme.org uh, gets exported to the file DTOS. So it actually writes all of the source code blocks to a file called DTOS, which is the DTOS script. But, you know, the org document gives me a table of contents and a lot of nice uh, comments and tables and images. If I wanted to image, for example, if I wanted to see that image, does that image? Let's see. Uh, toggle, what is it? Toggle image or toggle inline images. Does that image, is that link broken? I bet that link is broken. I need to fix that if that's the case. All right, so this is the beginning of the script. Oh, actually, this is not the beginning of the script. This is just org documentation. It's telling you how to run the script. You get clone the repository. CD into the repository and then dot slash DTOS to run the script, right? You guys saw me do that. Pretty easy. Potential bugs. We're not going to cover any of this because some of this may or may not uh, apply now because I've made some changes. Updating DTOS, of course, is done with Pac-Man SYU, just like any Arch-based system. Because uh, a lot of people ask that. Once you install DTOS, do you ever have to update DTOS by rerunning the script? No. The script 
does a lot of stuff. It installs a lot of packages. It changes your pacman.com to add a lot of repos, add some mirror lists and keys and things like that. And you only need to do that one time, right? Uh, updating your packages, just pacman syu. So you should never try to run the DTOS script more than once. Uh, if you were successful in installing DTOS the first time, you never need to run it again. If things change in the future, I add new window managers or whatever, there'll be packages that are in the DTOS repo. You just do a sudo pacman dash capital S name of new package that I've added to the repo and you just get that new config file for, you know, whatever I added. So that's how that works. More readme information. So this is the beginning of the script. So the beginning, uh, just some comments, DTOS, uh, dependency. The only dependency right now is libnoot. Libnoot is the libraries for whiptail dialog boxes. You saw the, the blue dialog boxes, check yes or no, and all of that. Uh, that is a program called whiptail, and it uses this library here to create those incurses, you know, like widgets. Yeah, the script must not be run as root. So first we check to make sure you are not logged in as root. So on Linux systems, the root user has a user ID of zero. So if ID of the user currently logged in is zero, you are root. And then I'm going to give you a warning saying, hey, don't run this as root. That's all that is. Pretty self-explanatory. Then some font effects. So in the output of the DTOS installation script, I did have some certain keywords that were bolded and colored a little differently. And how I do that is I set these variables. When I want a word to be bold, I have this variable bold equals T put. T put is a standard terminal command. Uh, and we set it to color two. So in whatever terminal color scheme you happen to be using, we're going to change that from the default color to color two, and we're going to make it bold. And then you know, after the word that I bolded, I want to set everything back to normal. I'll use this variable here, normal. T put SGR0 sets everything back to its normal font settings in the terminal. I also have a, a specific bold error uh, set to color three, just so it's a different color, so it stands out. So if there is an error message, it's pretty obvious what that error is doing. And the way this works is, well, here's the error message, right? I use that variable, bold error, that I defined. So that error here, in all caps, colon, that's going to be colored like an orange or a red color typically, and it's going to be bold. And then right behind it, I set the variable normal, meaning everything else after that, which is the actual error message. Make that just normal text. That's how that works. And then the whiptail exports. So this is all the settings for the libnoot stuff. So the uh, dialog boxes, this is their colors. So I could play with that, assign them specific colors. Uh, and then sync the repos and install whiptail. So the very first thing the script does of importance is check to see if the uh, libnoot libraries are installed on your system. On most Linux systems, they're probably already there, but if they're not, it's going to check. And if, if we're just gonna go ahead and do a pacman-syu to update your system and then install the latest libnoot. Now, typically you don't wanna do a pacman-syu name of package because that's what's called a uh, partial Oh, or that's not a partial upgrade. It would be SY and then uh, libnoot, but this is fine. We're going to update the whole system anyway, and all the packages are going to be the latest packages on your system. Actually, I think that's one of the very first things it does anyway, is it updates your system to make sure that the repos are synced. That way we're installing the latest and greatest packages. Uh, let's see. There was one instance of this bold font that looked off when we were doing the script earlier. But anyway, and then here are, this is an example of a whiptail dialog box. So first we define a function, bash functions are defined with name of function and then opening and closing parentheses and then the braces and then inside the braces, this is the whiptail command, whiptail and I'm doing a title box or uh, this is actually a message box but the title of the box is installing DTOS. The message box is the message inside the box. 16 by 60 is the, uh, the size of the box. So that's defining the welcome function. And then we run the welcome function, welcome. And then the pipe symbol, the double pipes that is welcome. And if it succeeds, keep going in the script. If it doesn't succeed, error. And error, remember we defined an error function up here. 
uh, where was the error function? This one here. So run the error, you know, give us the error. And this is a lengthy script. We haven't gone 10% through this script. <laughs> I don't want to explain everything that's in the bash script. Uh, but, you know, that's getting started with it is we define some variables. We check to make sure that libnude is there so we can use our whiptail dialog boxes. Um, and then we'll go through the rest here in a second. Let me get back to the chat just for a second. Make sure I haven't missed any exciting conversations here. Let's see. I'm using Peppermint OS at the moment. That was John. Yeah, I haven't looked at Peppermint lately. But I know in years past, I was always pretty impressed with Peppermint OS. Arch with DT's Qtile config. Been using Qtile for years. Yeah. Yeah, I have too. I, I've been a Qtile user well before most people have ever even heard of Qtile. I was using Qtile literally like 10 years ago. And most people had never heard of Qtile before I started my YouTube channel. <laughs> and I only been doing YouTube, you know, about six and a half years or so. So I was using Qtile uh, back when it was just like a few people even knew what the hell Qtile was. Because Qtile was, it was weird. Qtile was one uh, was around for many years, but nobody ever tried it. it. It wasn't something you ever saw on like Reddit, like r slash Unix porn. Nobody made videos about it. Nobody, nobody ever talked about it. And it was kind of strange because it's such a fantastic window manager. I think a lot of the reasons, a lot of the reason people just didn't talk about it is it just wasn't sexy as far as it's a window manager written in Python. You know, and of course, when the window manager crowd is typically built with nerds, right? We're, we're a lot of nerds. So, you know, if I can talk about how hard it is to configure DWM and I had to recompile it and I had to patch it and I had to write some programming stuff in C, you know, I, because I know the C language, you know, <laughs> that's cool, right? I had to script something in Python. That's not as cool. Hey, or Xmonad. You know, I had to learn a little Haskell to configure my Xmonad config. Man, you're hardcore, but, you know, Scripting in Python, anybody can script in Python. I think that was what initially why nobody even, you know, even looked at Qtile. It's like, oh, it's just Python. But hey, it makes sense. Why are we configuring window managers in compiled languages like C and Haskell anyway, right? <laughs> just do them in a scripting language, you know? Let's see, uh, is Enlightenment a window manager or a desktop environment? You can consider it a desktop environment because it comes with um, a lot of extra stuff. It's not strictly just a window manager, although most window managers are not strictly just a window manager. Most of them come with a panel and maybe some extra stuff, but Enlightenment especially. I mean, it has a panel, and full menu system, sys trays, and a lot of desktop widgets. I think it has some background services. That, like, it really is a desktop environment. It's kind of what you think of a desktop environment when you, when you hear desktop environment, right? But a desktop environment has a window manager. You can't have a desktop environment without having a window manager. So if you call it a window manager, I don't think anybody would complain. If, I, if you call it a desktop environment, I also don't think anybody would complain. Uh, Osmo, can you explain the issue with Wayland and Xorg? Is X going to pass? Or if you're asking, is X going to die? Uh, no, because I don't think uh, a lot of your Unix operating systems are not ever going to have Wayland. And the BSDs, many of them are many, many years away from ever being Wayland ready. X11 is not going away. Not for a long, long time. X11 will still be with us at least a decade from now. At least a decade from now. It may be with us two decades from now, right? Yeah. Uh, don't, uh, a lot of people, you know, it, there's, there's some scaremongering and fearmongering on the internet of, you know, X11. If like one day you're going to go to your computer and X11 is just gone and your X11 desktop environment is just, it, it won't work. And well, you should have already moved to GNOME with Wayland by now. That's, that's not the way this works, right? <laughs> just stay, stay on X11 if you need to, or if you want to. And but it's not even if you need to, even if Wayland worked, if you wanted to still use X11, hey, that's your choice. Just keep using it. 
But no, there are some operating systems that literally are way off into the future for Wayland. Like Wayland's not even Wayland hasn't even been thought of on things like OpenBSD or uh, some of the Unix stuff, Open Indiana or some Solaris and things like that, right? So and, and obviously these graphics manufacturers and you know the, these projects and companies they still have to support those machines so those are important machines many of them are operating as servers or uh enterprise workstations right so yeah x11 will still be with us for many many years so all right back to the script uh, DK window manager first is an X11 window manager. It's on Bitbucket. Okay, so it's for XOR. Yeah, it's weird that I don't know anything about it. it must not be that popular. I think I would have heard of it by now. Not that I care about popularity. Maybe I should check it out. All right, back to the script. Now, I don't want, again, I'm not going to get into the minutia of the script. You know, a lot of these functions are just whiptail dialog boxes. So when you start the script, it warns you that, hey, it's beta software, yada, yada, yada. Nothing to see there. It also checks to make sure you have parallel downloads enabled in pacman.conf because we got to install so many packages. Hey, let's speed it up. If you're using a vanilla pacman.conf that only has a parallel downloads equals one, let's change that to parallel downloads equals five, for example. So, you know, that's what we're doing with that grip command. We're gripping the slash Etsy slash pacman.conf. We're looking for the line parallel downloads with a hashtag. If it's hashtag, that means that line has been commented out, meaning we're not using parallel downloads. And that's when that triggers the speed warning function. The speed warning was this whiptail dialog box saying, hey, warning, the parallel downloads option is not enabled in slash Etsy pacman.conf. You need to enable that. That's all that is. Last chance. Last chance is a function that uh, displays a whiptail dialog box warning you that, hey, this is beta software. I'm not responsible if you break your machine. And then the installation really gets going. We grip for the LCC type variable in slash Etsy slash locale.conf. And if it exists, fine. If it's not, we're going to create the variable and set it to the same thing that you have for the lang variable. And that is all that is, uh, popping that into sudo t. t allows us to uh, append that file and insert these lines. Um, because we need sudo privileges, you have to use sudo t. And then we run our sudo locale-gen to regenerate our locale. Since we had to edit the file, you got to do that. And then... Adding the repos. So first we create a function chaotic AUR and it prints installing chaotic AUR, uh, adding repo and chaotic AUR to pacman.conf. And then we do a sudo pacman receive key. So we receive the chaotic AUR keys, we sign the keys, and then we run a sudo pacman dash capital U and we install the pacman keyring. And or the uh, chaotic keyring, sorry, and then we install the chaotic mirror list. And one of these bold variables, I'm on the lookout for the one that was, I can't remember which one caused the problem. All these look fine, maybe it was somewhere else. Anyway, and then we add chaotic AUR repo and DTOS core repo to the pacman.com. So all this does is we grip for this string here, chaotic AUR in brackets. If that already is in your pacman.conf, you've already got chaotic AUR on your system. I don't need to do anything, but if it's not there, then I'm going to go ahead and echo that line and add it to your pacman.conf once again by piping this into sudo t, by piping these echo commands into sudo t. And then I do the same thing. Oh, and then I do these. Oh, I went. Where am I at? Then I do the same thing for DTOS core repo. Basically the exact same block here, except now I'm adding the lines to add DTOS core repo to the pacman.conf. And once again, with echo being piped into sudo t, adding those to slash etsy slash pacman.conf. 
And then we have various functions for each window manager. Install Qtile, install Awesome, install BSPWM, install DWM, and install Xmonad. And just to fix the script, I know DWM is not going to work. Let's just go ahead and get rid of it. I know Xmonad polybar was kind of broken, but I think that's an easy fix. I'll fix that. But let's just get rid of the install DWM for now. With those packages, if you wanted to still play with my build of DWM that's broken, they're still in the repo. So you can still use them. Actually, I wonder if I should just comment out these lines and maybe try to fix them later. Uh, it's not like this is code worth saving. I mean, I, I can cre recreate these functions easy enough. I'll just delete them from the script for now. So that gets rid of DWM. But now I need to go down to, where does it ask me about the choices for DWM? You know what, let's search for DWM. Well, for, for one thing, we've got the choice box here where I say you've got five window managers, including DWM. Let's get rid of DWM from this whiptail dialog box because I don't want people to see it as an option. Let's see, is DWM, why is trying to execute some kind of code block, but I don't want you to. No, I think it was trying to execute this. It was actually trying to edit my pacman.conf. So there's no more instances of DWM in this document. Okay, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to search for DWM. All right. So now the next section was the whiptail dialog boxes where you choose your browser. We got the browsers function. And this is a whiptail dialog box that gives you these options with checkboxes. You check the pieces of software you want and then the other internet box here. So this is like your chats and email clients. Then the multimedia function here is a whiptail box for various multimedia applications. The office function is your office software. And then the games is, of course, games. And then we run each of those functions we've defined. Browsers, other internet, multimedia, office, games, one after another, right? So you go through checking the browsers, and then the next thing that appears is the other internet box. Then you check everything that appears, and then it runs the multimedia box, et cetera, et cetera. And then where the script, if it's going to fail, it's going to fail right here. And it sudo pacman dash dash needed dash dash ask for dash sy from the package list, where we're taking a the package list dot txt and we're feeding that into Pac-Man. We're having Pac-Man install all the packages listed in this file. So if I do, actually, I don't want to do a split. Let's just take a look at it full screen here. This is the package list.txt, a list of programs. And I noticed Emacs is here, as it should be, DTMAX. Remember, that was what was causing me a problem, is I thought my uh, Emacs configs were installed, they were not. So I definitely need to write that. I think that was the only program I saw that wasn't installed that needed to be installed. Let's get back to the config. So this is typically where DTOS, the installation script, will fail, is you're installing this on Arco Linux or Endeavor or Manjaro, and one of the packages I have listed in package list.txt either doesn't exist on their repos, or they've removed it, or they're using a version that's incompatible with what I'm trying to install, whatever it happens to be, Manjaro especially, because Manjaro holds packages back for a couple of weeks. So don't be surprised if you're trying to install this, for example, on Manjaro, and it runs into a program I'm trying to install and would install correctly on, say, vanilla Arch Linux, but it will not install on Manjaro. I've tried to remove a lot of programs I know cause an issue. One of the programs that I know causes an issue is Paru, which Paru was a major part of DTOS because it was the AUR helper that I installed. And then not only did I install it during the DTOS script, I installed it early in the DTOS script and then I used Paru 
to install the rest of the packages. I no longer do that because Paru has a very high likelihood of being broken and not installable on Manjaro. The reason is Man uh, Paru has some uh, Python dependencies, Python libraries it depends on. Because Manjaro holds packages back, its Python libraries are not up to date meaning the Paru that's in the AUR expects all the Python libraries that are in the standard Arch repos to be available to it, but Manjaro's Python libraries are not the same versions. Paru just doesn't work most of the time in Manjaro. You go to try to install it, it won't even install. Or if it does install, at some point it may be broken when you try to use it, and then you go to update it, it won't update. I got rid of Paru from the package list. But I still wanted an AUR helper installed out of the box by default on uh, uh, DTOS, so what I've done is, actually, let's go back to the top. Let's go to the updating. Where was chaotic AUR? Installing chaotic AUR, all right. This is why the chaotic AUR is now part of the DTOS script. The chaotic AUR has binary builds of Haru. It also has binary builds of the Brave browser. Those two programs were a nightmare. For one thing, I don't want to have to build them myself. It may take a while to build. Paru is not a very big program, but it's, it takes a few, couple minutes to build. Brave would take all day if I compiled Brave myself. And you know, I just I didn't want to maintain these packages. Even just maintaining a already pre-built binary of Brave, but me repackaging it as a binary on DTOS core repo. It's a huge binary. I mean, the file size for the binary package of Brave or any Chrome-based browser is a gigantic file. It takes a lot of storage space, a lot of bandwidth. People downloading it over you know, from my GitLab repos where I'm storing this stuff, and I. The chaotic AUR solves a lot of problems. So anything that can be installed from the chaotic AUR rather than the regular AUR, that's why the chaotic AUR is here. So a lot of those very big binaries or a lot of those programs that cause a problem, for example, on Manjaro where Paru from the regular AUR is going to cause some problems, it may not be a problem installing from the chaotic. Well, it still would be a problem because the libraries are out of sync. So that doesn't solve the Paru problem. But it solves the Brave problem. But what install what solves the uh, Paru problem is instead of installing Paru, I don't think I I don't have it in the list anymore. I removed it from the package list. But I know people want a AUR helper and one that should just work. It gets installed as a binary, and the way Arch-based distributions handle uh, Haskell libraries and the dynamic linking versus static linking and all that. I'm installing Aura. I've done a video about Aura as an AUR helper. It's a really nice program. Matter of fact, let's go back to the VM. Let's make sure Aura was installed. If I do an Aura, SYU, can't perform that without sudo privileges, of course. Aura is an AUR helper uh, written in Haskell, but we have Haskell on the system because we installed Pandoc and Xmonad in my case as well, but Pandoc's getting installed whether you want it or not. I think everybody wants Pandoc though. Aura with the dash capital A flag is uh, AUR. So if I do A Y U, you don't need a Y because you don't have to sync the AUR because you're building things from source typically from the AUR. But I think if I do a sudo Aura dash A U, yeah, fetching information. Maybe that wasn't the command. Uh, you do need sudo privileges. Maybe it's AS for sync. Maybe it's A. Uh, what is it? Do I have TLDR on this? I don't. It's been a while since I've used uh, Aura. I just put it back in, I think, yesterday. There is a TLDR for Aura. Let's see, update all AUR packages. They're using long form. Uh, I could read the man page. So it is dash A for the AUR sync. Let's see. Queen, depths, info, quiet, search, 
Sys upgrade, upgrade all install. Yeah, so that was it. So I think it did. That was the correct command. The reason I, uh, the AU command. The reason it didn't do anything is we don't have anything installed from the AUR. Remember, uh, with DTOS now, the only packages get installed from the AUR, or actually from the chaotic AUR, which is a proper repo of binary packages. So I have no real AUR packages installed. So that's why that command does nothing. If I did it on my host machine, it would try to update some things because I do have several AUR packages on my host machine here. But I'm not going to do that on camera because some of those packages have to compile and it would affect the stream. Anytime you compile software, uh, it sucks up pretty much all the CPU. Anyway, so that's the DTOS script for the most part. So we're doing the chaotic AUR. Uh, did I change something in the script? What was the last thing I changed? I think I added a character I shouldn't have added. Let me undo that just to make sure. Uh, program choices. The last thing we do is we do some checks. We check if certain files and directories exist. If they do, uh, we move them. We make backups of them. You know, for example, if I'm installing DTMAX, right? So I want to go ahead. I know I'm going to overwrite people's Emacs configs. So I'm checking if their existing Emacs configs exist. I'm going to make a backup of them. That way their configs are still there. They're backed up in case they did not want my configs for some reason. Which if you didn't want my configs, you shouldn't have installed DTOS, right? Uh, so that's all this is doing. Uh, all these lines here. are checking if various things exist. If they do, back it up. And then once we've checked to make sure all those important files are backed up, and then we copy everything and slash Etsy slash DTOS, which are all my configs. All that gets copied into the user's home directory. And that's how all the configs get there. Right? It's essentially like using slash Etsy slash scale, but because this is a post installation script, whatever distribution that you're doing this on already has slash Etsy slash scale full of stuff, and I don't want to have their uh, scale packages conflict with mine, so I create my own scale folder, essentially. It's the I call it slash Etsy slash DTOS. We change some file permissions to make sure certain scripts are executable on the system. Finally, we ask, do you want to use Polybar or Xmobar or both with uh, Xmonad? Polybar is broken. Again, I need to fix that one. Uh, we do some, uh, install some Pac-Man hooks for you know, anytime Haskell gets updated, I want you to recompile Xmonad so it works. We do some sed substitutions and some files for uh, to make sure DM scripts work. We recompile Xmonad again, just to be on the safe side. And finally, we ask you, which shell do you want your user's default shell to be? Fish, bash, zsh. And then finally, configure sddm to work with our theme. And then finally, DTOS has been installed. Do you want to reboot? Yes or no? And that's the script. And now let me do a get status. And we have changed some things. So I hope that some of those changes work. And I still got some things I still need to investigate. Uh, that polybar problem, I'm just going to probably remove the volume widget from it for now, just to, because it's an easy fix. Uh, yeah, yay is a UR package manager, yeah. And on some distributions, like if you did this on Manjaro, I think certain flavors of Manjaro already have yay. Uh, some of the community uh, uh, spins of it, not the proper spins. The KDE version, I don't think, would have any AUR helper because they don't want you to use the AUR like officially on Android. Some uh, other uh, distributions like Arco and Endeavor, uh, a lot of them may already have Yay and or Paru installed. So uh, if they're there, you'll have them. If they're not, though, at least you're going to have Aura. <laughs> so. Uh, and Aura, uh, for all your Pac-Man commands, you just do Aura, you know, the same flags as you do Pac-Man for stuff that's in the regular repos. For AUR packages, dash capital A gets you the AUR sync. Well, let's see. 
we've been going for about an hour and 20 minutes. Let's go for another 10 minutes. Uh, let's go ahead and shut down the VM. I'm going to go ahead and just do a quick uh, Q&A session with you guys in the chat. If you got any questions or comments, go ahead and get them in, and I'll answer them here in the last 10 minutes. But this was fun. I'm glad the DTOS script I've been working hard on for a while did actually work. Or, you know, it installed properly. There's still some bugs, but it, at least it worked. All right, back to your questions and comments. Uh, let's see, I've honestly never used anything other than Yay. What does Paru have that's different? Paru pretty much has everything that Yay has because uh, the lead dev of Paru used to work on Yay. So a lot of the same flags and options. Paru does seem to have a little more active development, but I, I don't know. Or at least it did, especially when it was kind of new. It was kind of the new hotness everybody moved to. Uh, but yay, I mean, if yay's working for you, keep using it. If Paru's working for you, keep using it. There's a million of these AUR helpers. Like I said, I'm installing Aura just because it's nice. Some of the ones in the past, I, I, there's a lot of them that have died over the years. I don't know if... People still use things like Trizen, uh, was another popular one that people used to use. And there were a bunch of them. There were like dozens of these things that have come and gone over the years. Yeah, Yay is a AUR package manager. Well, they're AUR helpers. They're not really a, a package manager because uh, when you install something from the AUR, whether you do it through Yay Paru or you just manually do it uh, yourself, where you get the package build and do your Pac-Man dash capital U or whatever, you know, you you make the package and then install it. Um, Pac-Man handles anything that gets installed. Pac-Man actually is the, what manages those things. Like if you install something from the AUR through Yay or Paru, how do you remove it? Well, you do a Pac-Man dash capital R for remove name of package, right? You don't. Do, you could do Yay dash capital R name of package, but all Yay is doing is telling Pac-Man to remove the package. I mean, Pac-Man is still your package manager. All Yay and Paru and... uh. Aura and these AUR helpers are doing, they're uh, streamlining the process of building those AUR packages. All right, they're, they're making the package for you instead of you having to go to a terminal and do a, a make package and, you know, all that. Which, you know, managing your own AUR packages is not hard. It's not, it's not like it's a ton of work. I've actually made a video about managing your own AUR packages without an AUR helper if you want to do it. For me, I like having an AUR helper. Yeah, Yay and Paru seem like the same software to me. Yeah, they're essentially the same. They act the same. Like 95% of what they do is, yeah, in each. DT, is TMUX on the package list? No, because uh, I just didn't add it. I didn't add anything that didn't need to be there. And the reason is, uh, yeah, it's, it's a script that installs a bunch of tiling window managers. Do you really need a terminal multiplexer if your window manager is essentially a terminal multiplexer? Because, <laughs> you know, you open a bunch of terminals and you can arrange them, you know. Not to mention that uh, DTOS is going to be heavily built around Emacs, which Emacs, of course, has splits in it. Right. So... Uh, Tmux is really only useful in the TTY, like if you didn't have a graphical environment and then you then, you know, yeah, it's like, yeah, I guess I now I kind of need to use TMUX. Although because Emacs is still installed, even in a TTY, you can use uh, the terminal version of Emacs in a TTY. You could still just use Emacs splits. So I haven't added it, but anybody that wants TMUX can just install TMUX themselves. It's not like that's a, a big deal. I didn't want to add it unnecessarily because most people are not going to use it anyway. Let's see. Hey, DT, I've been unsure about Luke Smith and a lot of his takes regarding FOSS software. Is it okay to disagree with those takes and some of his takes on freedom and use of strictly only FOSS Libre? Well, I haven't, I haven't seen Luke Smith on YouTube in years. I don't know if he even makes videos anymore. 
As far as it, is it okay to disagree with anybody? I don't forget Luke or me or who. Is it okay for you to disagree with people? Yeah, I'm, I would say yes. <laughs> like that's normal. Um, if you disagree with takes on using strictly only FOSS Libre software, well, uh, if you can't use only FOSS and Libre software, it's not really a choice you can make anyway. Like for me, I've mentioned people have asked me why I don't use like uh, one of the Libre distributions, like the Free Software Foundation approved distributions on my workstation here at the offices. I can't get any of those things to actually install properly on my equipment. It's the Linux Libre kernel, the fully freed kernel just doesn't work on my machines. And then on my laptops, you know, my Wi-Fi cards don't work with without proprietary drivers. So I get it. It's one thing, you know, I, I certainly promote boss software, right? Free software. I want to use free software everywhere, but sometimes you just have to use proprietary software. You can't get around it in some instances. And then in certain areas, there's certain sectors of software where there is no free software. Like all the software is proprietary. And I've mentioned before, like banking and financial software, trading software, stock you know, brokers, you know, all of that. 100% is proprietary software. There is no free software in the financial space. Uh, for obvious reasons. <laughs> so what are you going to do? You just, you're never going to do any online banking, right? No, no you have to, right? It would be like, oh, you're never going to have a Visa card or, you know, MasterCard, whatever, debit cards, credit cards. All that's obviously proprietary software. Everything, everything that interacts with the global financial systems is propri proprietary software. You can't just be strictly 100% Libre. Even Richard Stallman, even though he says he is and claims to be, he, even he really can't be. Like, he has to go to a grocery store on occasion and swipe a card, even if he's just using cash. I mean, he's interacting. If, if he's doing like a self checkout, I'm assuming, you know, these days everything is a self checkout. Is any of that stuff free and open source software? I hope it is, but who knows if it is. Let's see. Glitch says Have you ever looked at Kickstart? NeoVim, or do you not mess with that stuff since you are very Emacs heavy? Yeah, because I do everything in Emacs. I mean, I, I haven't. There's no point in me getting into serious like NeoVim configuration and stuff if I'm not going to really use NeoVim. Usually, I, I have NeoVim installed on all my machines. I installed NeoVim and DTOS, uh, but here's the thing: NeoVim is there. Like, if I'm in a terminal or I'm in a TTY, I'll just use NeoVim if I'm there. Even though I can use Emacs in the terminal, uh, you know, if I'm make, doing something quick where I'm just making a quick edit, just quickly, just NeoVim. No reason to launch Emacs in the TTY in that case. If I'm doing something where I'm going to be editing text for a while or editing multiple files at a time, then I'm just going to, if I'm in a graphical environment, then I'm always going to launch Emacs. There's no reason not to. Tmux is good for image previews with NNN. So your terminal file manager, yeah. I don't really use terminal file managers either. Not these days. I, I, this is my file manager. <laughs> the terminal, right? <laughs> my file manager is I just, you know, CD around into things, right? ls into things if i want to move something i'll move it or copy it or you know whatever uh, that's if i want a graphical file manager and this is going to be crazy but here's my graphical file manager <laughs> emacs right that's the dear ed uh, the directory editor in emacs basically a file manager in emacs i have a, a obviously pc man fm is the gui file manager i have on my system and I sometimes will open it. I like having this open uh, while I'm recording videos. That's why I keep a GUI file manager on hand. Just because I, that GUI file manager, when I'm pressing record, stop recording, you know, I can see the files being created as I'm recording in OBS. Or if something like a Dear Ed buffer, or, you know, obvious terminal thing, you know, they're not updated in real time. You know, I would have to manually refresh them and... 
All right, guys. Yeah, zero AD. Well, I need to get back into playing some zero AD. I've missed zero AD. Yeah, Dolphin has spoiled me. I dread using Windows now more because of the file manager. Yeah, Dolphin's a great file manager. It's just a shame that it's so tied into KDE. Like, if you're not using KDE, you're really not going to install Dolphin. All right, guys. Well, let me get out of here. I appreciate you guys. You guys in the YouTube chat were awesome. I want to quickly before I go, I want to thank the patrons of the channel. So I'm going to show some names on the screen here. I want to thank each and every one of these guys for help supporting my work over on Patreon. And other than that, I'm going to probably spend the rest of the afternoon trying to tidy up the little bugs in DTOS. Other than that, guys, peace.